This Commodore 64 had been broken and left in storage for over 20 years, and I had to track down three faults to bring it back to life. Stay tuned and I'll show you how I fixed it using the help of these Arduino gadgets that I built along the way. Are you keeping up with the Commodore? Cause the Commodore is keeping up with you. Are you keeping up with the Commodore? Cause the Commodore is keeping up with you. My family bought this Commodore 64 around 1984, just a few years before I was born. My own earliest memories of computers were really of 68K Macintoshes and Nintendo. But when I was around 10 years old, this Commodore came back out of storage and served as the first computer that I learned to program. And while it got me through the basics of BASIC and kept me busy for a while typing in programs from old magazines, when it came to replicating the graphics and sound on my own, I just couldn't make sense of all the poke and peek commands. And I eventually moved on to a TI graphing calculator with more powerful and intuitive BASIC commands but I still like to pull out the Commodore 64 from time to time and load up old games. Unfortunately, the last time I can remember setting it up, it just sat there lifeless with a black screen, and I reluctantly put it back into storage, hoping that one day I'd know how to fix it. Well, 20 years and a computer engineering degree later, I figured it was time to bring this old computer back to life. Taking stock of what was left in storage, I found the computer and 1541 disk drive, but the video cables and power supply were missing. It's recommended to replace the original power supplies anyway, so I went ahead and bought a brand new one along with an S-video cable to get the sharpest video output. How cool is it that in 2023 you can still buy brand new parts for Commodore 64? After confirming my original observation of a black screen, I figured that the first course of action should be to try a dead test cartridge, and I decided to make my own by downloading the code to an EEP ROM. If you'd like to learn more about how that works, you can check out my earlier video where I designed this Arduino based EEP ROM programmer. Now booting up with a dead test cartridge, I was still greeted with a black screen, but now along with a sequence of white flashes. Not the most exciting result, but it was at least a sign of life from the CPU and pointed to a problem with memory, or possibly with the PLA, which is a critical logic chip that directs how the CPU, memory, and other chips talk to each other. On one hand, the PLA in early Commodores was known for a manufacturing defect affectionately called the purple creeping crud. But on the other hand, these Micron 4264 DRAMs aren't known for their reliability either. I figured it was about 50-50, so I went ahead and ordered replacements for both. But before I can install those, it's time to open up the computer. There are just three screws on the bottom, along with some plastic tabs that come free when the keyboard is hinged forward. After pulling the cardboard shield out of the way and removing the keyboard connector, there are six more screws to remove. Finally, the motherboard lifts right out and we can get rid of the cardboard RF shield. But there's still a sheet metal RF shield, preventing access to the back of the board. It's attached with tabs that are soldered in place and take a bit of work to pry out of the way. Now the shield is free and we can take a first look at the back of the board. All the joints look clean and shiny and just a bit of flux residue is left in some places. I've heard the quality control can be hit or miss, but this one at least seems to have been made pretty well. I also pried back this cover to get access to the video chip, and numbered each of the memory chips so I could keep them in order. That just left me with the painful process of carefully desoldering 156 pins without pulling any traces. This would have been way easier with a vacuum pump desoldering station and I'm definitely going to consider buying one before I do any more work like this. But I was able to persevere with just a manual solder pump. After giving each of the desoldered pins a little wiggle with the iron to make sure that they were loose, the chips came free without any resistance. These should never be forced or pried since that can easily result in a damaged circuit board. Before moving on, I decided to install sockets for each of the removed chips. So going forward, they can be easily swapped out without reaching for a soldering iron. After all the manual desoldering work, 
Soldering the new sockets in place was practically meditative. With the DRAM removed, I was now able to test each chip individually. I already made a whole video about how I designed my own DRAM tester, which you can find here, but long story short, the old DRAM chips passed with flying colors, and were well within their rated timings. So my hope now rested on this replacement PLA. At this point, I powered on the system, and was greeted by a proper dead test screen. So obviously the original PLA was toast, not much of a surprise there. But attempting to boot into BASIC still resulted in a black screen. Since the dead test had worked, I figured it was worth giving these other cartridges a shot as well. First, I played a bit of Jupiter Lander, Then I loaded up Omega Race. These both ran just fine, and that gave me a big relief that the precious video, sound, and interface chips were all working just fine. At this point, I was starting to suspect the ROM chips. Since the Dead Test and Ultimax game cartridges bypassed these, but would otherwise prevent the computer from functioning. When I poked around with a thermal camera after the system had been running, I noticed that the kernel ROM was oddly warm compared to the other two ROMs next to it, and I figured this was plenty of evidence to warrant pulling out at least that one chip. But I might as well pull the other two and add sockets while I was at it. And thus began another 72 pins of painstaking desoldering. Fortunately, no traces were harmed, and the ROMs came free without any fuss. As before, I soldered three more sockets in place to make swapping the ROMs easier in the future. But for now, I needed a way to test the 24-pin ROM chips. These are actually fairly similar in pinout to the 28-pin EEP ROM chips that I'd used from my dead test cartridge, so I was able to modify my design and build a new programmer that supported both pinouts. I set about validating the pulled ROM chips against reference copies downloaded from Zimmers.net. Both the basic ROM and character ROM matched perfectly, but the kernel ROM was unresponsive and clearly dead. So I used the programmer to make a fresh copy of the kernel on another 28C64 EEP ROM. But because of the pinout difference, I needed to make an adapter for the Commodore. I found a couple examples where people modified a pair of 24 and 28 pin milled sockets, so I went ahead and copied this design. However, instead of tying chip select to ground for always active, I decided to tie chip select and output enable together, which greatly reduces the power and heat dissipation. And here's the final product. It's not very pretty, but it'll do. I verified the ROM again, this time as a 24 pin chip, to make sure that the adapter works, and I was finally able to reinstall the validated ROM chips. I put the keyboard connector back in place and booted up the system. And look at that, it worked! This calls for a celebratory 10 print. Uh, except the keyboard doesn't work. Poking around a bit, I did find that some of the keys worked, and they appeared to be on the same column of the keyboard matrix, which had me worried about a damaged CIA chip. But I had just been playing Jupiter Lander with a joystick, and that shares some of the same CIA lines as the keyboard. So I had a hunch that the problem was more likely with the keyboard itself. I pulled out an ohm meter, and I started checking key press resistances at the keyboard connector and I was getting readings in the thousands to millions of ohms. 
Clearly, this keyboard needs to be fully disassembled for a thorough cleaning. Eight more screws hold the keyboard to the case. Then every keycap needs to be carefully removed with a keycap puller, being mindful not to damage the plunger or let the captive springs fly away. I saved the space bar for last since it has a stabilizer bar that needs to be unclipped and the keycap pulled by hand. I noticed that some of the springs had a bit of rust on them, so they all get to take a vinegar bath. And speaking of baths, I might as well give the case and keycaps a quick scrub in soapy water while I'm at it. Moving back to the keyboard, these jumpers need to be desoldered from the shift lock key, and a bunch of these little screws need unscrewing. Finally, we have access to the plungers and the circuit board with the key contacts. The contacts were visibly oxidized, so I first went over each of them with a rubber eraser to make them nice and shiny again. This brought the key press resistances down to several hundred ohms, but this still seemed a bit high, so I decided that the plungers needed cleaning as well. I've seen other people use graphite pencils or special graphite paint for this, but I just gently rubbed them with the same eraser that I used for the contacts and that brought all the resistances down to around 90 ohms, which seemed about as good as it was going to get. Meanwhile, I found that the shift lock key didn't make any contact at all. This is a mechanical switch similar to the ones found on mechanical keyboards, and like those, I was able to open it by prying back these clips. The top piece has a plunger that slides up and down, which presses against a metal clip on the bottom piece, which makes contact and closes the switch. For good measure, I scrubbed the contact surface with the eraser and bent the metal clip a few times until it made a more reliable contact. Finally, the keyboard could be put back together, first replacing the screws, then reattaching the shift lock key with a soldering iron. Next, the dry and rust-free springs went back in place, followed by the clean and shiny keycaps. Again, I saved the spacebar for last since it takes some extra care clipping the stabilizer bar back in place. And lastly, the keyboard was refastened to the case with screws. Now we can plug the keyboard back in and give the celebratory 10 print another try. Well, everything appears to be working, so I went ahead and added large copper heat sinks to some of the chips and then put the motherboard back in place and resealed the case. For the final test, I'll load up one of my favorite games with a flash cartridge. And there we have it. The Commodore 64 that I had once only dreamed about being able to fix is now back in service. Of course, I haven't tried out the serial port yet, and I still need to investigate the 1541 disk drive. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you'd like to see more repair videos like this. And as always, thanks for watching.